approval and excitement about discovering that serotonin um, was in the brain and was one of the neurotransmitters. And so the company set about in the lab trying to find a substance that would change serotonin levels in the brain. I, I imagine they made a decision to increase the levels because there was a theory that low levels resulted in violence and suicide. Violence and suicide are from this whole complex, huge brain we have. And it's not from some biochemical balance. It's from us, the social being, which, by the way, is even more complex than the brain. So if you're thinking, wow, my brain's complex, believe me, you are so much more complex because you're social. You're not just your brain. You're your mother, your father. Not just physically from genetics. They made you. Whoever raised you. So you're as complex as them, and they're as complex as a few other people. We are really complex. We're a network of folks. We're way beyond our brains in complexity. So the next time somebody tells you that you know biochemical imbalance in the brain, first of all, we don't know anything about the brain, so forget that. But we do know that not only is the brain complex, but as a person, you're infinitely more complex than the brain. <coughs> So Eli Lilly managed to find a drug, which eventually became known as Prozac, which interfered with the normal removal of serotonin from the active place in the brain, the synapse. The connect synapse is the connection between nerve cells. Synapses are like little teeny teeny bitty soups. And in these soups are all sorts of things going on. And one of the things that's going on in so many soups is cell A is producing serotonin and cell B is getting it out of the soup. And that fires cell B. Is that clear? Cell A fires cell B by dumping some serotonin. It's pretty much like a gasoline engine with a spark. A little bit. And then you get something like electrical conduction going on. Okay? Well, why in the world would you think that mucking about with something like that was going to do some good? Remember, serotonin's everywhere. Cerebellum, frontal lobes, amygdala, wherever you look. Gut, blood. So, they wanted to promote a new miracle drug that would be harmless and effective. But what they had proven was that it was causing brain dysfunction. And they also knew from the beginning, and didn't tell folks, but the research, they published the research in little germs but nobody paid any attention, was that the brain immediately reacted. So after the first dose of Prozac, which now flooded your engine with serotonin, you have the picture here? It's, it's blocking the removal of serotonin from the synapses, so you're flooding the synapses. As soon as that happened, dose one, the brain said, I have enough of this already, and it stops producing serotonin. And then come a cascading number of defense mechanisms in the brain. You now know more about this than any psychiatrist. <laughs> Literally, the cascading chemical defenses against the drug. So that what the drug has effectively done is corrupted normal neurotransmission, the brain is struggling to correct it, and you have a severely imbalanced system going on in the brain which nobody can predict. That has no idea what's happening. No, no idea. And this, of course, is going to affect other neurotransmitters. Now, you've heard about five or six neurotransmitters because the drug companies pour money into studying the neurotransmitters they think they can sell something for. But there's probably two or three hundred. Many we don't know about. This is this complex system beyond our awareness. Now I want to take a quick look. Oh, a little aside that I got, kind of thing I'd get by being the expert in these cases. The first uh, person in charge at Eli Lilly of the studies, after they got done with the rat studies, it could show that they knew how to disrupt serotonin and could therefore claim it was going to fix serotonin in your <coughs> brain. A little bit of a jump. They gave it to some volunteers. 
Well, the volunteers were so messed up by the drug. Because the drug for many people is very agitating. It's like taking a dose of methamphetamine for many people. That's one of the ways you get the violence and the suicide out. <coughs> and this guy said, we're gonna, if we're going to promote this drug, we're going to have to make it a second-line drug to be used after the others have failed. So the leadership of Eli Lilly said, okay, and they fired him. They got a guy to come in and say, oh, no, I'll go along, but this is going to be a miracle. They fired him. Um, so how do psychiatric drugs work? Why, why do people like poisons? What do they? Why do doctors want to give poisons? Well, one reason I wanted to give you the history of psychiatry is because psychiatry has always poisoned and harmed its patients. It's as if the psychiatric mantra is first do harm and then see if it works. Mm. Quite literally. We've done everything to mental patients you can conceive of. You think of some atrocity, rape? Well, there are doctors out there saying sex with their patients help. Just think of anything damaging and we've done it. Chop off front lobes, pass electricity through your brain. We still do both of those. There's still two places now in America that do psychosurgery, the most arrogant places, Harvard and possibly Brown. Brown may have recently stopped due to old age. This, the man who, most likely the man who's telling you what to do with your patient, that's his tradition. That's what he knows. So-and-so is acting out. Well, right, hold him down, give him a shot of hell, don't. Damage his brain, we don't care. We know how it will damage his brain. We now know that all psychiatric drugs long-term damage the brain. Huge disability being created. We're going to talk a little about children along the way. Uh, bef before we started the massive drugs of children in recent years, hardly any children were ever psychiatrically disabled. Now we have hundreds of thousands that are psychiatrically disabled. It's the drugs. Along the way, in order to try to understand what was going on, I developed the brain disabling hypothesis of psychiatric treatment, which I now believe is so true that I just call it the brain disabling principle. And that is that all psychiatric treatments disable the brain. And then it's a matter of, do you benefit in your own mind? Or does somebody else benefit, which is often the case, in their mind, about you being somewhat disabled? Now, this is not really far-fetched, because think about alcohol. We're always disabling ourselves with alcohol. I mean, when, when you take a drink to handle a social situation, take a drink to go to bed, and I don't mean this prejudicially, and probably every sin there is almost. <laughs> but when you do that, you're disabling your brain. Your brain isn't saying, oh, wow, I love alcohol. It just lulls me to sleep. Thank you, thank you, it's like sugar. Your brain says, what is happening to me? It fights. That's why after you've had a few drinks for a few nights in a row, it's harder and harder to go to sleep. That's why if you become alcoholic and drink all the time, when you stop, you get the DTs. Hyper, hyper brain comes out from under the alcohol, because you, your brain's gotten hyper to fight the alcohol. Your brain didn't welcome it. Your brain didn't welcome Prozac. Kid's brain isn't welcoming Ritalin, or Adderall, or Focalin, or Conserva. It's fighting it. So all psychiatric drugs disable the brain, and all of them produce complicated defensive responses, which also eventually harm the brain. Because if you're on a drug for many, many years, then when you come off, your brain may be quite fixed in its defensiveness. It can be hard for it to catch back up. You can see the difference in children, where children's brains are meant to a lot more a lot more, I don't like the word plastic because we are some, a lot more spiritually neurologic or something. You know, they're just so much more complex, they're so much more flexible. So the children often recover more quickly, not always. All right, so I'm going to go quickly down the drugs and tell you how each of them get a reputation for helping. The, all the antipsychotic drugs pretty much block dopamine. 
which is the main neurotransmitter system to your frontal lobes. So if you're taking a Bilify or Risperdal, I know some of you are, it's like Rexa, it's blocking frontal lobe neurotransmission. And I'll explain later, you may not realize it, but it is. Because that's what it does. Now, is it specific for schizophrenia? Well, if it was, these wouldn't be the most, uh, the biggest money makers in the business now, are the antipsychotic drugs. Because they're being given out to so many people. They're not quite the top drugs in, the, in how many people take them because they're so expensive. But they are the top revenue drugs now. Because they rank 6, 7, 10. They, they rank near the top. And they're very expensive. So they're, obviously, since there's only 1%, supposedly, 1% of us are schizophrenic, you know, who's taking all these drugs? Well, it's, they're a generalized effect. They, they produce what it, you know, in the concentration camps, you had, to, you had to just destroy a human being morally before you could say, walk to the gas chamber and they'd go. They had to become robotic. You do it now with one dose of an antipsychotic drug in sufficient doses. And the person becomes, one dose of the antipsychotic, the person becomes robotic because of the frontal lobe suppression. Sufficiently. One dose in the emergency room and your problems are over with Mr. Jones. How do those, like perhaps they're it doesn't matter. You can put these same drugs into a dart and shoot it at a lion, and then you can go to the lion and pick its paw up and examine it. See if he needs any help. Pull the score now. Instead of doing, doing it gently as the, the story of uh, Daniel and the lions then, instead of doing it with love, you know, just do it the other way. Get in the dark. That's why those drugs are used in nursing homes, wherever you want control, prisons. I'm now the medical expert in Canada for um, a class action suit we're bringing to try to stop the drugging of uh, mostly elderly ladies. By elderly, I mean 10 years younger than me. <laughs> elderly ladies in the, in the homes of Canada, men and women, mostly women, you know, being drugged. Um, there's no specificity at all for it. The antipsychotics are not antipsychotics, they're deactivating. They develop the phrase deactivation. They deactivate the person. And I'll, I'll get to why people, how people don't notice this in a, in a couple of minutes. Now what about um, children and um, the, the uh, drugs for um, their bad behavior? First of all, let me, let, oh, by the way, um, there's lots of evidence that giving antipsychotics to people who are mentally disturbed is much worse than giving them nothing other than love and attention. There's a lot of data on that. But long term, people do better without the drugs. And if you have the proper setting, short term, they do better. A lot of what I'm saying is summarized in, in my book, Psychiatric Drug Withdrawal, which I think is here. The first half of psychiatric drug withdrawal, thank you, Jesus. The first half is about what the drugs do, why you want to get off of them. It summarizes, and it's and actually in more frightening detail than I'm giving you, how damaging the drugs are. And then the second half talks about how you can carefully go about withdrawing, hopefully with team support from the drug. And all the concepts here are in that. Um, there is no evidence at all, despite probably maybe billions, certainly hundreds of millions of dollars been spent trying to prove by the drug companies to prove that the stimulants help children. There's no evidence that they do anything other than subdue behavior for about four weeks. By that time, the brain's caught back up. The brain's saying, no, 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 no. Um, there's no evidence that these drugs help learning, none. If you just get beyond the fact that teachers will give you a better grade if you sit down and shut up, understand. <laughs> By the way, no one in here has attention deficit disorder. I don't see a single person who isn't glued to me in here. <laughs> <laughs> but what is the cause of ADHD? Childhood. <laughs> <laughs> 
lousy teaching and confused parenting. So, if I see somebody here who's tapping their feet or wrestling their newspapers or whatever, I go up to them and ask them, what's the matter? Am I boring you? Um, there's just no evidence the drug helps. And now, with the help of my wife, Ginger, who's been scanning, scans the research on a base, daily basis, Twitter is really interesting. If, if uh, even obscure research pieces that are critical of psychiatry pop up on Twitter, I mean, there's this, people are just communicating like crazy with each other. I know we're a relatively small group around the world. I mean, it's just amazing what shows up. So she, and then she reads the research. Um, no, she's not a psychiatrist. In fact, she dropped out of college to defend me when they went after my medical license. And it was, of course, of her that I won, her efforts to publicize it. She's just, she's just brilliant, devoted, dedicated, and sent by God to rescue a repressed Jewish boy in his 40s. And <laughs> she did. I haven't been depressed since the third year of our marriage. <laughs> We've been married now well over 30 years, um, and I haven't been lonely in all that time. And before I was nothing but depressed and lonely. So relationships matter. They really, really matter. Um, and the way we give the same things to our patients, because we have, we have this opportunity to have such intimacy. What an incredible thing that we have this sacred trust to be really intimate with people that we don't know, whom we have nothing else to do, presumably, and whom we can give a sense of worth and value and caring and, and so on, too. <clears throat> Is the voice holding up okay back there? Uh, see, uh, Frank, Frank is too tall. <laughs> he's, got, he's got the tall gene. It's an aberration. <laughs> Short people know, know how to handle it. <laughs> All right. NIMH held a conference on ADHD and its treatment in the 90s. And um, the con it was called the Consensus Development Conference. That means you get all the experts, the best 30 experts in the field together. They present to an audience of four or five hundred mostly media people and a few advocates. And in the front row is a consensus panel. That is thoughtful, often scientifically oriented human beings who presumably have no vested interest. <coughs> and this is done for things like mammograms. It's been done for sleeping pills. It's done for surgeries. It's an attempt to get a consensus. Well, they set up this consensus conference on ADHD and his treatment, they didn't have anybody assigned to talk about adverse drug effects. So somebody at the very top of the hierarchy, above NIMH in the Department of, of uh, Health and Human Services, HHS, noticed this and said, you can have brain talk about adverse drug effects. You can imagine how welcome that was, but they had to. <laughs> um, so I called the head of the conference. His name was Peter Jensen. <clears throat> Peter was a worldwide known advocate, though probably the greatest expert in the world on these drugs and ADHD. He was the NIMH go-to guy running the conference. And I said, Peter, I don't want to just talk about the adverse drug effects. I want to talk about the behavioral science studies we have that show exactly how the drug works. Animal studies. He said, we don't have any. I said, Peter, we got dozens and dozens. He actually didn't know about the scientific literature. And I'm sure he didn't care. Maybe he got a glimpse of it once and realized it would ruin his career if he even cited one of the animal studies. Because the animal studies in Ritland give us such a model for, for the, what, I call, what I call the brain disabling principle of psychiatric treatment. The, if you give a chimpanzee, think about a chimp for a minute. If you want to think about it, think of a two-year-old. Chimps are human, like human beings. 
allegedly, and you know, a lot of this stuff turns out to be BS, but allegedly they have 99.6% of our genes. And they behave very much like us. They hug, they kiss, they have alliances, they sometimes have small families, a big brother, for example, if a mother dies, might rescue and nurture a little brother, or somebody else's little brother. Uh, they fight, they have dominance, and they get into struggles. Um, and Jane Goodall, who is the master woman of research of these of Chimps in the Wild, discovered, much to her distress, that they actually have wars, too. Because her group broke apart, and the bigger group killed off the littler group. That was just like us. Um, they like to play, they like to run. It's very hard to get them to sit in school all day. <laughs> really difficult, unless you give them a stimulant drug. Because what happens when you give a stimulant drug to a chimp? It's carefully laid out in the literature. There's two things. One, there is a, <clears throat> a reduction in all spontaneous behavior. All spontaneous behavior. So the chimps stop playing as much, they stop fighting as much, they stop exploring as much, and if you put them in a cage, they look like they're hardly bothered by the cage. Because they're not doing anything. Crushes spontaneous behavior. But then there's another thing. <clears throat> they become OCD. They become compulsive. In the animal literature, it's called perseveration. Perseveration. So what, what does that look like? They chew on the bars, they pull out hair, which kids will do on the drugs. They pull out hair, they stare stupidly. They, they become OCD. And the only study, and this was added in our age, that ever looked at this problem found that at least 50% of the kids on these drugs got clinical OCD. And the, the good studies show that they're almost all obviously dampened down, many of them depressed. I'm going to have a lozenger. When you get to be um, my age, I'm 77. When you get to be my age, you get tired a little more easily and your voice complains about things. It complains about extreme activity. Other than that, it's fine. <laughs> um, If it's really disgustingly slurpy, let me know. <laughs> Literally, you make a good caged animal by suppressing spontaneity and encouraging OCD. Well, that's exactly what happens to the children. They're making good caged children, whether they're at home or whether they're at school. Now. I'll take a slight detour from the drugs and say, well, how do we get the diagnosis of ADHD? It actually is created by drug companies to sell a drug. A group of psychologists, not just psychiatrists, psychologists, led by very evil people, literally went around and figured out what behaviors bother teachers that falls short of like psychosis. Because they knew, they had knew in their hearts that they were just going to be suppressing behavior. So they wanted to list the behaviors the teachers would be happy about being suppressed. So if you read the diagnosis, that's where these funny things come in, like uh, squirms and seed. I mean, how many mothers have brought their kids to a pediatrician and my son squirms and seed drug? Teachers, yes. Talks at a turn. How many parents think that way? That's, that's teachers thinking that way. Or my favorite, interrupts to answer questions before they've been fully asked. You know, the kid who's so social, he finally knows the answers. He wants to show up. I know that. I know, I know the answer. Goes, give him a drug. You're interrupting me. <laughs> I haven't checked yet in the new DSM-5, but the four <clears throat> actually has <clears throat> Excuse me a minute. <clears throat> I will be all right. Don't anybody worry. The four actually has a section how written, how the ADHD disappears if the kid's having fun, if the setting's interesting, or if discipline is 